Hey everybody. Today we're talking about evaluating classification models using confusion matrices. I'm going to approach this topic through an example, this one, where I'm imagining an algorithm that's supposed to identify potential users of a new service on a website. So maybe I'm adding a new button to my e-commerce site, trying to guess um, if customers are going to actually use that new button or not. Now, um, for every case in a sample, I have two possible outcomes. Either they'll click or they won't. And I have two possible predictions. Either I predict that they click or I predict that they won't. And that gives us this two by two grid. The way to read this is uh, as counts. So I have in the upper left hand corner, 33 people that use the service that I predicted would use the service. While in the upper right hand corner, I have, 33, I have 22 people that use the service that I predicted would not use the service. So this is a confusion matrix. And clearly there's two desirable results and two undesirable results. And I've shaded them. In the upper left and the lower right, we have the true positives and the true negatives. In the upper right and lower left, I have the false negatives and false positives respectively. So for instance, in that lower left, I have the ones that did not use the service that I predicted would. So the false positives. Now at first blush, this algorithm might seem to be doing pretty well. It has an accuracy of 88.4%. So I added up those green boxes, the desirable outcomes, and I divided by the total sample size, 250, and I got 88.4%. Seems pretty high. I've got a good chance of classifying a randomly selected user correctly. Unfortunately, this doesn't necessarily give a full picture of the effectiveness in the algorithm. And one way to see that is just by comparing to an algorithm that just always classifies a potential user according to the majority case. In other words, classifies everyone as negative. Most users aren't clicking on the button. I know this. So I'm just going to predict that no one's ever going to click. If I apply that stupid algorithm to this data, let's see here, I have 195 total negatives and that stupid classifier is gonna get 188 of them right, 78%. So uh, in comparison to the one that we are actually considering with this confusion matrix, which had an overall accuracy of 88.4%, this, uh, um, this new algorithm is only doing a few points better. Of course, accuracy is not the only numerical way of describing the success of a classifier. And in this vid, we're going to cover a few important ones and nod our head in, nod my head, I'll nod my head in the direction of a few others. We can talk about sensitivity and specificity, both of which are thinking, generally speaking, about the, po the false positive and false negative rates. Or we can think about precision and recall, both of which are trying to give context for the true positives in the data set. There are a number of other measures. I um, am currently putting together a video on, Ka on Cohen's Kappa, which is essentially controlling the accuracy rate based on the probability of success using a random classifier. That's a sort of broadly speaking um, description of it. We could talk about the true and positive likelihood ratios. We could talk about the F score. There's many other potential ways of looking at a confusion matrix and summarizing something about it numerically. Each of them answers a slightly different question about the classifier's performance. And so over the next few slides, I'm going to think about the words I have in boldface here, sensitivity, specificity, precision, and recall, just uh, um, in the context of what questions they actually address. First of all, sensitivity. This is the proportion of positives in the set that are properly identified, the true positive rate. So in this case, we're just looking at the top row in that confusion matrix, the actual positives. In this case, there's 55 actual positives and our algorithm is pulling out 33 of them. So we have a sensitivity of 60%. If it's a high priority for us to identify the actual positives in the set, this is not doing so great. We're letting a lot slip through the cracks. For instance, if we have a medical test for a fatal disease that uh, we really, really, really have to catch, we're letting a lot through the cracks here and this is potentially dangerous. Of course, sensitivity is gonna be complementary to the false negative rate, the proportion of true positives that are wrongly classified. Specificity, on the other hand, is the true negative rate, 
the proportion of negatives in the set that are properly identified. So now I'm just looking at the bottom row of this confusion matrix. There are 195 actual negatives in this example, of which my algorithm has caught 188. So that's 96.4% of the actual negatives that my algorithm is classifying correctly. Specificity, of course, is complementary to the false positive rate, the proportion of true negatives that are wrongly classified. That would be 7 out of 195, about 3.6%. Precision and recall, on the other hand, are instead looking at context for the true positives in the set. That's the upper left-hand corner in this confusion matrix. Precision represents the proportion of positive classifications that are actually positives. So in this case, there's um, uh, 40 positive predictions, um, 40 positive classifications, and of those, 33 are actually positive. So we have a precision rate of 82.5%. This is kind of telling you how reliable your prediction is, a positive prediction that is. So if your model says that uh, someone's going to actually click on that button, how confident can you be on that? Higher precision tells you you can be more confident. Recall, on the other hand, is representing the proportion of true positives that are detected by the test. It's quantitatively the same as sensitivity. So I'm taking the true positives as a fraction of all the actual positives. So again, that's 60%. There isn't a single best measure for the performance of a classification model. There's just not. You have to think about real world considerations when you're thinking about what measure you're going to take to be most important. In particular, you're thinking about how important is it to identify true positives and what's the cost of false negatives. I'm sorry, and what's the cost of false positives? You can think about how important it is to identify true negatives and what the cost is of a false negative. A moment ago, I was talking about medical testing and how there might be tremendous costs to having a, uh, a false negative, where someone with a fatal disease has slipped through the cracks. Conversely, there can be a lot of costs to uh, a false positive when someone doesn't have a condition um, and we say that they do, where the treatment might be expensive or invasive um, for a condition that, you know, maybe isn't, uh, isn't quite so life-threatening. Now, um, there's lots of other metrics that we could use, lots of other ways of approaching classification problems other than just confusion matrices. One in particular that I mentioned earlier is the receiver operator characteristic graph and uh, the corresponding quantitative measure of the area under curve. So even these measures that I've talked about and nodded my head at in this vid don't give a complete picture of, uh, of, a, classific of a classifications problem, of a classification algorithm's performance. This is a complicated question, but the confusion matrix is a good place to start.